Um, I'm a little shorter than a lot of the people up here. <laughs> so I'm Diana Little from Enuma Aerospace, and we're building partial vacuum lift for sustainable aviation. In 1663, 360 years ago, before helium or hydrogen were even discovered, Francisco Lana de Terzi theorized that vacuum, being lighter than air, could lift a ship into the sky. A drawing of his concept is at the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum in Dulles, Virginia, and I was delighted to see it in 2020 in person. In 1710, Gottfried Leibniz, one of the inventors of calculus, was taken with that concept and used his new math to write a proof, which proved it would not work. So the idea was essentially abandoned. And more recently, in 2015, Akhmatelli and Gavrin uh, once again proved that a thin shell, homogeneous structure of material, a spherical structure, would not be able to resist the buckling forces when enough vacuum was pulled to overcome the weight of the sphere. Science fiction writers have not given up, though. One can find vacuum airships in the writings of Neil Stevenson, Ian Banks, and Kim Stanley Robinson, to name just a few, and they happen to be some of my favorite authors. Just recently, I heard Kim Stanley Robinson on a podcast, Futureverse, and he was asked about the current airship renaissance, what we're doing here. And he said, well, I love it. I want to ride on one. I hope they prosper. So there we go. Um, in 2019, he wrote a novel, The Ministry for the Future. And in there, uh, airships are everywhere. They are absolutely ubiquitous, replacing airplanes for all but the most critical needs. And the reason for that is because carbon emissions of airplanes have become so untenable that environmental terrorists have started to shoot them down. One reason that science fiction writers return to the vacuum airship is that it helps make airships more practical so they can be ubiquitous in the story. As we all know here but don't like to admit, Helium is expensive, non-renewable, tied to the natural gas industry, logistically insecure, and notoriously leaky. Hydrogen is arguably worse. Both also make airships difficult to land and handle on the ground, and we really need that zero static lift feature to safely and easily handle cargo and passengers. You have all done incredible work in mitigating these issues, but what if you didn't have to? Anuma Aerospace has patented an innovative geodesic tensegrity structure built of carbon fiber and enveloped in a multi-layer membrane. The partial vacuum lift, we call PVL cell, is evacuated to at least 70% to generate lift. At 85%, the lift capacity is equivalent to that of helium. This invention will in need, eliminate the need for any gases. It will simplify airship ballasting and ground operations by behaving like a submarine in an ocean of air, letting air in to descend, pulling deeper vacuum for buoyancy. It will allow a vehicle to stay aloft indefinitely as any slow leaks or atmospheric pressure changes can be addressed by running the onboard vacuum pump. It will allow for more efficient navigation with its increased control of elevation. And it works, it is not a thin, homogeneous shell. It's built of a material up to 10 times stronger, five times lighter than steel, which is carbon fiber. We've built small-scale test articles that we iterated upon, which reached the initial target of 70% vacuum. At that point, we started a program of finite element analysis and simulation and manufacturing readiness. So we got into this initially because we are concerned about climate change and we saw a way to make a really big impact. Say what you like about globalization, we are one world and we need to get goods and people from one place on the planet to another, reliably and cost effectively. Our current shipping systems have been shown to be highly emissive. Container shipping alone contributes one gigaton of carbon dioxide per year. Many types of freight carriage can be electrified if they're short trips and good work is happening in those areas, but this is one sector that is very, very difficult to decarbonize. The shipping industry is experimenting with hydrogen, methanol, and ammonia as alternative fuels. But while they improve the carbon emissions, they have their own drawbacks, and alone aren't going to be able to meet international goals. Notice I'm not even really talking about air 
aircraft, jet aircraft. I actually don't see them as the main competitor because they're useless for cargo, as Barry pointed out. At Air a new aerospace, we have a vision to decarbonize long haul heavy lift transportation. And since we're driven to make the biggest impact possible, we've decided net zero isn't enough and we're going for net negative. First part of the puzzle, LTA itself. Airships are very, very large, so covering them in thin film solar cells makes sense to harvest the energy required for running the vacuum pumps and control systems. Airships work best if they can sail prevailing winds, and back when they made regular transatlantic trips, the best captains used that technique. It's not easy with helium, because lifting gas doesn't allow much control of buoyancy. Partial vacuum does. And I'll get to our solution for better weather information to pilot our ships in a bit. But what about when the sun isn't shining or when we're operating at latitudes where solar power is less available? And what about the weight and cost and environmental impact of batteries for backup and night running? We need something that is safe, easily storable, and environmentally benign. What we came up with is air, more specifically liquefied air which is not at all a novel concept. There are liquid air energy storage facilities already in existence. And here's what we realized about liquefied air. It's existing mature technology. It can be produced sustainably anywhere there is available renewable energy. No negative environmental effects. 700 to one expansion ratio, giving about the same energy density as lithium ion batteries requires no subsurface mining, no tailings. It can be stored in non-pressurized tanks, which are far lighter, and it's safe, non-toxic, non-corrosive, non-flammable, and it's affordable. It's literally orders of magnitude less expensive than batteries or hydrogen. When additional energy is needed aboard the airships, liquefied air is expanded 700 times its liquid volume through a turbine that generates electricity. The exhaust is simply air not even water. Remember, water vapor is also a greenhouse gas. This gets the entire system to net zero with the capability of moving cargo anywhere in the world 24-7, 365 on renewable energy without any of the negative impacts that ships currently have on our oceans. I promise net negative. So here's the third piece of the puzzle. Liquefied air production systems already separate out water vapor and CO2 early in the process because they turn into <laughs> ice at higher temperatures than the other gases and clog up the pipes. The CO2 can be stored in tanks, run through a process called molten carbonate electrolysis, again using renewable energy to convert the CO2 into carbon nanotubes or graphene, which may then be incorporated into composite structures for the airships themselves. In this way, the energy storage system for this airship also does direct air capture of CO2 and sequesters it within the system. That's how we get to net negative. And our patent pending lighter than air transportation system using cryogenic energy storage is what we call LASE. Determining the overall impact of our solution involves quite a bit of math. Um, examining particular trade lanes can provide insight. We analyzed the typical journey of a single fully laden 40 foot container with a gross weight of 34,836 kilograms from Zhangzhou, China to Northwest Arkansas's Walmart hub via ground transportation, uh, truck and ship. It's estimated to emit 635 metric tons of CO2 and take approximately 16 days, barring any dwell time at the port or other disruptions, which there are almost always other disruptions. Of course, that container is just one of thousands. So assuming it's on a ship carrying 8,000 TEUs, 21 knots, its share of the emissions is 2,522 kilograms of CO2. And a new aerospace airship will be able to take that load point to point from the factory to the Walmart headquarters and central distribution center in Bentonville, Arkansas, which is a distance about 11,611 kilograms, or kilometers, <laughs> kilometers, with zero emissions within about five days. Extrapolating just the avoided emissions of journeys such as this one carrying high value goods, we've used the Clean Energy Ventures Simple Emissions Reduction Calculator for startups to determine our solution will avoid nearly eight gigatons of CO2 by 2050. 
of course, to make a major impact, we'll have to be flying hundreds, if not thousands, of these airships. We'll also need to put Lay's plants around the world in places where sunshine, wind, hydro, and or geothermal sources are available, such as many coastlines, the global south, and the Arctic. These are also places where airships are really needed. The beauty of these puzzle pieces is that they are not technically complex. They, at in comparison to airplanes and lithium ion batteries and hydrogen. The systems themselves will be drivers to clean economic growth in traditionally underserved and undeveloped areas and won't require the types of invasive infrastructure such as ports and highways that have been necessary in the past. The developing world can skip several damaging rungs on the economic development ladder. And finally, as I promised, what about weather? All forms of transportation are potentially disrupted by weather and airships are notoriously vulnerable to it as they often fly within the atmospheric boundary layer. According to meteorologists and atmospheric scientists we surveyed, no one has solved the 4K to 7K foot area for ice or wind, and the atmospheric boundary layer is drastically undersampled in the vertical dimension. Last year at the Aviation Innovations Conference in Toronto, I remember Dr. Bob Boyd's list of what systems were needed for LTA operation, and one of them was, in aircraft weather forecasting for plus two, plus four, plus six, and plus 12 hours. Climate change is making this ever more difficult as long-standing models are rendered increasingly inaccurate. And we can't use machine learning to fix them because there is no data to feed the machine. Anuma has been awarded a phase one SIPR grant to, to study the feasibility of Pegasus, a persistently elevated gas-free aerostatic sensor utility system. It will float within a configurable geofence using prevailing winds to navigate. It will continuously sample direct measurements of temperature, humidity, wind speed and direction, particulates, and any other readings that are critical to forecasters. And it will transmit that data to the internet cloud and be available via API. Anuma intends to own and operate a constellation of these aerostats and will sell the data as a service. The system will act as a very important intermediate, intermediate stepping stone to our ultimate goal of decarbonized, long-haul, heavy lift transportation. As we work towards this first product, we are also very interested in working with the LTA community via licensing our partial vacuum lift cell technology. And please approach either myself or Dave, uh, Chief of Staff, during the conference to start that conversation. And thank you, and I'm ready for questions. <laughs>